This week on Arts Insight, a bit of thunder sounds out alone. It obviously is very different in some ways, but equally as rewarding. I mean, people do. An artist who interconnects his love of art and sports. Know what figures to put in what poses, and that there's a lot of trial and error in that. Recreating one of Las Vegas's gems. I think that by doing a project like this just reintroduces it to new generations. I think they're going to appreciate it as well. And we take a look at how one teacher changed the lives of many. And somehow that piece of paper, that blank piece of paper, cared about what was going on with me and how I felt. I'm Ernie Manous, and it's time to get Arts in Sight. Welcome to Arts Insight. Today, we're at the newly reopened Alley Theater in downtown Houston. After 15 months and nearly $50 million in renovations, this local treasure is ready to start welcoming back in audiences, and we're going to give you a private tour of all the changes throughout the show. But first, in 2010, Emmett Kale became a member of the international singing group Celtic Thunder, recording albums, touring the globe, and building a loyal fan base, while at the same time developing his solo act. This year, while still occasionally appearing with Celtic Thunder, he is releasing his own album and out touring all by himself. Moon River is actually the first song I ever recorded. recorded in my own living room and my dad played the piano and so for for that reason I always bring that one into the show not just because it's a beautiful song I, I feel of a real connection to it I grew up in a very musical family so my dad is a piano teacher so he had me playing piano since I was like four I think um, when my when my legs were like swinging at the piano still um, barely able to touch the floor. My mom and dad, they used to sing at a lot of weddings, corporate events, stuff like that. So as we got older, they used to bring us along and my dad would play the piano and my mom would sing. But over time, as we sort of got more confident with singing, she would sort of push us more out to the front. She sort of was happy to sort of fade into the background and quickly the musical quartet became established then. It was myself, my brother, sister and my dad. We were, were known as sort of the Von Traps around our hometown of Mullingar. I was in college in the Royal Irish Academy studying opera and theatre and all that and very much on that trajectory. I heard about auditions for Celtic Thunder then went in and sang for them and it actually went really badly. The first audition went so bad because I kind of went in and did my opera thing thinking okay they're going to be impressed by this and they just said to, to me Emmett okay we know you can sing but come back the next day and do something a little bit different first um, so I walked out and decided oh, well, I wasn't going to go back um, I just thought maybe it's not my thing and um, my dad actually in fairness to him he made me go the second day so the next day I brought in my guitar and sang songs that reflected me just being a 19 year old guy from Ireland and um, they loved that then and they thought well that's maybe what people want to see they want to see the real you not this guy who's training to be an opera singer and it's weird I walked out that the, the audition thinking I think I got this On the water we have walked like a fearless giant um, and, and that's never happened before because you're always unsure um, and thankfully it did all come about and before I knew it they were bringing me over to America and I was on a tour bus and on TV and stuff like this it was it was pretty funny pretty surreal I gotta say um, but an absolutely amazing experience when I moved on from that and wanted to do my own shows and do my own tours and um, it obviously is very different in some ways but equally as rewarding I mean people do get to know me a lot better now so this was the first year I got to do my solo thing and I've learned a huge amount um, about how to how to do that and um, most of all I've realised that yeah I love doing this and I really want to do it for a long time to come so long may I continue <laughs> the sea 
To find out more about what Emmett is up to, visit EmmettKale.com. Now, as we mentioned at the start of the show, the Alley Theatres had a major facelift. Renovated front of house, larger stage in the newly structured theater, and a massive reworking of the backstage areas. And here to tell us all about it is Alley resident acting company member, Todd Wade. Hello, Todd. Hey, Ernie. Good to see you. What a great place to be working at this moment in its history. It happens once in your lifetime as an actor to be involved with something this new and it's the most exciting time since I've been at the Alley, and that's 16 years now. Wow, has it been that long? It has, <laughs> yes. Now, Speaking we, of facelifts. Yeah. <laughs> we all talk about how important the structural changes are, but as an artist, all of this is very important to you. What has changed and why is it important to what you do? The most important thing always for an actor is the relationship to the audience. And that is the primary change, despite all the fantastic bells and whistles, the doubling of the washrooms and the fact that we have a shower heads in the curtain that don't come up to here. Um, it's the relationship to the audience. Yeah. We're 15 feet closer to the audience. The audience wraps around us now. Uh, acoustician came in and made the sound perfect going all the way to the back seats. There used to be a center vom, a kind of gaping hole that we could go out from the stage into the audience, but it disconnected us at the very center of the audience. That's gone now. And you have two VOMs, that's uh, entrances under the audience that come onto the stage. You can cross fade scenes. You can disappear from one as a scene pulls on from the other. The seats now are 10 to 15 feet closer at their farthest and everything is new, so we know the audience is comfortable. Even things to do with things like air conditioning. There used to be one system from the 50, 60s when it was built, and now there's three independent systems because we get hotter on the stage than the audience wants to be cooled down in their part of the theater. And so it's just a fantastic thing to be involved with. But that's the primary thing. The relationship to the audience is closer. It's more wrapped around. The sound pings out there now in a way that, especially in the back seats, didn't happen before. And we all were talking backstage after we came off from the first time being on this new set, and we couldn't believe it. What will that change for what you can present here also? Well, a change I didn't mention is most theaters, uh, modern theaters, have a fly loft. That's a system where there's a big, essentially, box above the stage that set pieces can disappear into. So you can change very quickly. Something just drops in silently, another one goes out, and we're in a new environment. We didn't have that. So they did a lot of research into fly systems and have the state-of-the-art fly system now for the alley theater. And it's very unobtrusive despite its size and, and the necessity of doing that. And I actually think it looks fantastic. So. All in all, it was a real win, and we can do that fly system now. Yeah. Are you noticing a reaction from the audience? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Yes. Um, I actually went to uh, a restaurant called the Vera on a break between two of our preview shows, and a lady was sitting beside me who'd seen the previous preview and said, we love the new theater. We love it. Why didn't it happen earlier? <laughs> um, well, these things are enormous changes, yeah. and they take a lot of planning, a lot of timing. And uh, Greg Boyd and uh, Dean and Ten Ike Swackhammer just were superlative, in including everybody in that process. To find out everything that's going on here at the Alley, where can folks go? Alleytheater.org. That's theater spelled R E at the end, not E R. Alleytheater.org. Come and join us. It's the most exciting time to be involved with the Alley. Thank you so much, Todd. Thanks, Ernie. Now, the ancient Chinese philosopher Confucius said, choose a job you love and you'll never have to work a day in your life. One Central Florida artist lives his life by that credo. What I do is I'm a sports artist. I do action portraits of players on different basketball teams primarily. Uh, I've done a lot of work with the Orlando Magic and now I'm doing a lot of work with the University of Kentucky, where I'm from. How I put together a composition to bring it to life is you have to know what figures to put in what poses, and that there's a lot of trial and error in that. As you're creating the composition, you do have to take into account uh, a flow. Uh, are, you, are you telling the player's story via their expressions, via their personality? Uh, I think a lot of that goes into a successful piece. The art 
process I use is, uh, is quite tedious when you try to get the accuracy of, of uh, a person's face. You, you have to be very accurate and careful with the drawing. As I'm closely painting someone's face, and I, I use a jeweler's loop on top of their photographs, so I look at their, their look at their picture, then paint, and go back and look and paint. And it's a very tedious back and forth process. It's like I'm looking into their eyes, I'm looking into their soul, and I'm getting involved, you know, uh, not necessarily emotionally, but just as part of the project. You don't get the eyes and the rest of the face. You can't paint your way out of a bad drawing. And so for me, that's the key. It's just something I enjoy doing. It's, I'm a, I'm a, I've been a big basketball fan, and certainly growing up in Kentucky, you have to. <laughs> it's almost law that you have to. Uh, follow the big blue, but I am a, a passionate uh, fan of that and it translated to the magic. That started a 10-year run really where I was uh, a featured artist in Magic Magazine. And that then led to them asking me to do some fine art portraits of their star players, uh, primarily Dwight Howard at the time. And I uh, was fortunate enough to meet Dwight many times. Uh, he's bought several of my paintings and some of the other artwork sold in the arena as reproductions of those original paintings uh, to, the, to the Magic fans, and that went pretty well, too. In 2012, I went to New Orleans for the Final Four, and I ran into coach Joe B. Hall, who was, uh, I knew when I was in Lexington, and uh, he uh, put me in touch with Coach Calipari and, and the uh, UK administration, and uh, it's, it's just been great. I've, I've been very lucky to uh, do several projects for them now. The time can go from <laughs> very slow to very fast. Depends on what kind of flow you get into, or uh, if, if you know you make any mistakes. Certainly, that's the beauty about painting. You can always go back and paint over your mistakes. The 2012 artwork it took about eight months, start to finish, uh, and it was, it was a very tedious process because I had a lot of faces to paint. Um, uh, we did about, I guess, 17 figures as part of that composition. That went very well and I've just completed a, a, a one for their 1978 championship team, which Coach Hall uh, uh, led and Jack Gibbons. Um, and, and I was just very flattered when they asked me to do that commemorative print for them. When you sit back and look at it, okay, I think I did a pretty good job there. And then to have that validated by fan support and comments you get from people who are buying the prints, that makes all that tedious labor all worth it. it there's just nothing like it in the world. For more information, visit facebook.com slash art. Next, in the 1950s and 60s, Louis Prima and Keely Smith were the swingingest musical powerhouse on the Las Vegas Strip. Best known for his high musical energy and her deadpan responses, the duo would later influence another famous performing couple, Sonny and Cher. Louis and Keeley live at the Sahara is a new production about their lives helmed by Oscar-winning director Taylor Hackford. My mama taught me, never stop smiling, never do a bad show, and rule number one, always listen to your mama. Oh, midnight. Showtime. When the music hits you, you can't help but start tapping your toe because these musicians and Louis Prima and Keely Smith were great. Angelina adore you. Louis and Keely Live at the Sahara is really a musical play. It's very much a star is born story because Louis Prima was a huge uh, a music force in America. <laughs> In the early 50s, rock and roll came in, and all those big bands died. But Louis Prima's uh, motto was, this cat's got nine lives, <laughs> and he kept reinventing himself. Now, piano. What's that, that cat played with Chuck Berry? With Johnny Johnson. Got dig, 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 dig it out there. Now, bring the plumber like a chiba diba doom -ba. Now. He met this young 17-year-old girl in uh, Norfolk, Virginia. Her name is Keely Smith. She is a big fan of his. He, you know, she saw him when he was at the height of his career uh, at the Steel Pier in Atlantic City and um, just 
you know, couldn't wait to meet him and wanted to sing for him. I'm Dorothy Keeley. My uncle said you were looking for me. And what are you wearing? I was at the beach. I got here as fast as I could. You can't come on stage like that. She yes, she can. I've got a prom dress in the trunk of the car. Yeah, go get it. That's more like it. <laughs> I own every album you ever made. Great. <laughs> You and you alone bring out the gypsy in me. You're catching on. Whoa, 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 whoa. He heard her voice and thought maybe he could, you know, put something together and have her as a backup singer. And they uh, invented this act called the Wildest. Got a break to play two weeks in Vegas, and but to do um, a series of sets that would start at 11:30 midnight and go until five, six o'clock in the morning. I look in your eyes and I'm glad you're mine. When I'm in your arms, it's so divine. She look crazy, me just going to call your name. Baby, 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 do you feel the same? That act uh, proceeded to sort of explode. The acts at the time, of the 50s and 60s, the headliners that included Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, Sammy Davis Jr., Debbie Reynolds, Tony Curtis, who after they were, those headline performers were performing, they would go and see Louis and Keeley uh, performing in this lounge. And it just sort of continued to roll from there. I'm gonna tell the rats about you, we'll pack them in. Hey folks, this is the hippest room in Vegas, am I right? I started writing this show with uh, Jake Broder at a tiny 99 seat theater in Los Angeles called Sacred Fools Theater. And um, Taylor came and saw it, that's how he met us. He came on board and he uh, knew Keely and started bringing her to see the show. She told me a lot of things that had never been published about uh, Louis and Keeley, and also about Keeley and Frank Sinatra, various people, friends of theirs, people that were involved with him at the time in Las Vegas. And he then did some expansion, and instead of it being sort of a specifically a musical review, said, I think there's a particular art. When the end comes, I know that such a gigolo. I'm pregnant. <laughs> Save it for the stage. <laughs> I have a fellow named Anthony Crivello, who happens to be from Milwaukee. You know, he, he was born and, and raised in Milwaukee, came to Chicago, cut his theater teeth here, and then went to New York. You know, it's, it's really kind of a privilege to play, portray a man like this. I mean, not only because of my background, my, my heritage, but, um, but, but also be, because it's the, the um, complicated, complicated character, uh, many layers I'm still discovering. I'm not trying to do an, imper uh, an impersonation, rather to create the essence of who this uh, this gentleman was. Um, you're looking at language, how he spoke, you know, um, certain body posturing, how he moved, not only walked and talked, but also danced, and how he flowed, how he conducted a band. It's all those important pieces. And, and then, very importantly, how he worked with Keely Smith. Anytime he can throw in a little something from Milwaukee. So we have a character coming in uh, to his first show, and he says, where are you from, big guy? And he says to me, Milwaukee. So then I just started improvising, uh, flying to just get him across the stage. Uh, Milwaukee. Oh, I like that Blatt's beer. And um, it became part of the script. I've been listening to you since I was a bambine. So Anthony Crivello is playing Louis Prima, and he is a consummate performer. He is great. He's got a great voice. He's a fantastic actor. Louis Prima is from New Orleans. He had a New Orleans accent. And Tony has completely digested that. He's great in the show. Then I joined in matrimony with a girl of Sir Spamoni, and Angelina will be mine. Oh, forget about me. Don't worry about me, because I'm Be happy, my love. Keely is another indelible character. She's got such a great voice. She had such amazing style. And Vanessa Claire Stewart. She's from New Orleans. She grew up listening to Louie and Keely. Louis Prima was a native son of New Orleans, and she loved the story. She understands Keeley, and I must say, Keeley saw her in Los Angeles do this role and put her seal of approval on her, which is a big deal. Oh, black magic has been a spell. Oh, black magic that you weave so well. The reason we're here is that Keeley Smith said Chicago was her and Louis' number one venue. For some reason, their music clicked with a Chicago audience. And Keeley said that when they were here, they just stayed and stayed and stayed, and people didn't ever want them to go, and she loved it. What you're going to hear in this show is a variety of songs from the Great American Songbook, but all done in that specific Prima or Sinatra style. Every time it rains, it rains, pennies from heaven. Don't you know?
you know, I think that by doing a project like this just reintroduces it to new generations. I think they're going to appreciate it as well. The music is just, whether you're young or old, it's just catchy, you know, and um, I think there's just magic between the two of them that hopefully we are recreating. Yeah, when you leave this theater, you're happy. You've seen something, you've been touched, I hope, by the drama of it, but you leave going, yeah, I was really entertained, and I think that's the goal. And finally tonight, teacher Aaron Gruel shares stories from an undeclared war, the real-life chronicle of 150 at-risk students from Long Beach, California, who were once considered unteachable, until they learned the power of the written word. My name is Aaron Gruel. Schools are divided into separate tribes. Freedom Writers, the feature film based on the true story of teacher Aaron Gruel and her students who transformed their lives through the written word. Now, two decades after their introduction to Room 203, and in their own words, the documentary, Freedom Writers, Stories from an Undeclared War. My, my students entered my class uh, September 6, 1994, and the one commonality that all of my students had was they were very transient. They moved a lot, or they were foster kids, or when you, ha when you grew up in poverty, um, oftentimes you're picking up your stuff and, and leaving. So the commonality that they had is they didn't have stuff that anchored them to their childhood. So there wasn't photos, there wasn't home movies. And I realized that if I could help have some kind of archival footage of the time that we were together, initially I thought it was just gonna be that one year, the freshman year. So I started taking pictures with Polaroids and I started bringing my, my video camera. And what I started doing to help with the literature I was using was showing them incredible documentaries to bring the books to life. And one thing led to another, where I was able to stay with this group of students their freshman year, their sophomore year, their junior year, their senior year, and dot, 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 we're now at our 20th year. I was able to help these students go off to college to, to graduate and now become these incredible scholars. So we were sitting on 20 years of footage and 20 years of incredible photographs and these mementos and, and timepieces of our time, not just in my classroom, but our adventures outside the classroom. And so we started weaving this together, um, hoping that we could tell a story and hoping that it would have a life outside of room 203, or our, our initial classroom. We knew it was like our place. We cared. You know, we offered hugs instead of insults, um, comforting instead of gossip. And we were becoming a family. The beauty of our story is that we kind of put the word fun into dysfunctional family. We are a family regardless of biology and regardless of skin color and, and the gods that we pray to. It's, it's one of the most beautiful elements of our story is that we came together and have stayed together all this time. The name of the book is The Freedom Writer's Diary, and we've got some of the Freedom Writers here along with their teacher, Aaron Gruel. Not only did they survive and they are very much alive, but they're thriving, and they've got advanced degrees, and some of them are working on PhDs, and they've got jobs, ironically, that reflect their pain, if that makes sense. A lot of my students became teachers even though they hated education. A lot of them became uh, working in the, with therapists or counselors even though they were tragically abused please survive that's all i can say because of the neighborhood i grew up in i had to pretty much have that persona of somebody that didn't take no mess that was like my coat of arms to be able to walk through my neighborhood every day and that just wasn't me i wasn't that person that's really what our story is about in the documentaries. These freedom writers telling you this was my story as a kid. This is how I overcame those obstacles. But as an adult, these are the things that I need to do to help other kids live and thrive. And so it's a, it's a really holistic story of where they were, how they changed, and more importantly, where they are today. When we started writing, this girl kept telling us that it was important for us to tell our own story, and I never truly understood that, because I always thought that my story had already been told. 
I believed that teacher that told me that I was not going to go anywhere. I believed that judge that told me that I was going to go back to Juana Hall. I believed everybody that told me that I was never going to make it. I listened to Ms. G tell us that we could write about whatever we wanted on some stupid journal that she gave us. In the first two weeks, all I wrote was, I hate Erin Garau. If I wasn't on probation, I would probably shank her. But the funny thing that happened to me is that when I wrote that down, it actually made me feel better. Because I didn't feel anybody cared about how I felt. Because who cares about what happens to some girl in, you know, that's from East LA? Who cares about her? Who cares about her and what she goes through? And somehow that piece of paper, that blank piece of paper, cared about what was going on with me and how I felt. For more information, visit freedomwritersfoundation.org. And that does it for us on this episode of Arts Insight. Next week, we enter the world of large-scale artist Suzanne Sellers, and we get into a box, Box 13 Art Space. That plus so much more. And thanks to the Alley Theater for letting us run amok here today. For all of us here at Houston Public Media, I'm Ernie Manoos. Thanks for watching, and have a great week.